Yeah. Or like, uh, kind of like put down in a way, I guess. Yeah. Okay. If it, um, like, uh, yeah, there's a lot of examples of uh, mocking other cultures. Like for mm. some reason, the uh, the Indian accent lately has been uh, a push button issue uh, all of a sudden where it was quite openly accepted in things like The Simpsons. What else? Asa, you have something? When is cultural appropriation bad? I don't know what appropriation means, actually. It means, can someone explain what appropriation means? I'll give you Take an yours example. Their permission. What was it? Taking something that's not yours without the owner's permission. Essentially yeah. taking something out of context. Kim Kardashian wearing dreads and posting it all over social media. I was thinking about the same thing. I remember there was um, a big thing on Twitter a couple of years ago where some girl, for her prom dress, it was like in the style of a kimono. And people were calling it <laughs> cultural appropriation, even though the girl really just wanted to wear a pretty prom dress. Yeah. Because like racism is such a sensitive topic in culture and society nowadays that like anything that touches the edges of it, like people don't consider it that. Yeah, like a, a lot of people probably wouldn't have called that cultural appropriation, but thousands of people on Twitter did. So there was a whole like mob mentality about it of people just <laughs> yelling at this girl. Yeah. I think then um It becomes an issue when it starts to um, mock with other people's culture intentionally. But um, I also feel like men, it is very easy to offend someone even though you don't mean that. But because of the background, of their culture people are a bit sensitive so i think the line is very thin about it is um you know okay and not okay and well, to be honest if i have to be yeah to that point there's um, a growing consensus that um uh, we are all responsible for the way something lands with our audience. So I might, with the best of intentions, say something, present something, embrace uh, a, a culture beyond my own. And um, being, uh, I'm not sure, I'm not saying I agree with this, but increasingly um, we are being held responsible for the way our expressions land with the audience um, and we have to consider with empathy the way things land that we are producing so that's that's one of the cultural norms that are are being debated uh, in society today the other thing beyond mocking let's let's move from mocking uh, to emulation it used to be um, less controversial than it seems to be now. Um, when Elvis uh, Presley famously um, took the norms, the, the attributes, the, the style of, of music that was um, uh, part of African-American culture in the United States and took it on as his own and became uh, world famous, uh, that was uh, arguably a cultural appropriation where he wasn't mocking, but he was taking credit for uh, creating something when it was more appropriate to say he discovered it and he embraced it and he started uh, emulating it. So Chinese food, 
Who likes Chinese food? If I'm Chinese food. Is that cultural appropriation? No, that's just you like Chinese food. Yeah, enjoying one's culture. Well, there's a difference between like real Chinese food and then like American style Chinese takeout. Well, that's another question. Um, Chinese food as we experience it in the United States is really, um, if you're looking at my video, I'm doing air quotes, Chinese food. It's not really Chinese. Uh, it's, it's a cultural construction uh, unique to the United States and it's spread from the United States outward. How do we feel about uh, Arabic numerals? We have appropriated Arabic numerals. Is that a cultural appropriation? And how about written writing. language? Written language uh, is Phoenician, uh, came from Lebanon. Is that a cultural appropriation? Or should we be uncomfortable in using Arabic numerals and Phoenician alphabets? I think it's just a matter of if you take credit it's your own culture. It's I don't think it's an issue if you like enjoy it or use it as long as you know that it's not yours and you know where it comes from and you understand like the background of stuff because that's when you can offend other people from the culture because they probably know it better. Yeah, that's well said. Like that. So a big theme of this lecture has to do with the flows of influence uh, around the globe. Uh, we think of globalization as being something new and unique, uh, but uh, it is not. Um, it is been going on for a long time. Some historians point back at uh, the 1890s when global trade was unfettered uh, at the height of colonial exchanges. There was a lot of uh, exchange uh, across the planet that uh, really uh, was un unperturbed by any borders and boundaries uh, between nation states. So arguably, we had stronger globalization back in uh, the 19th century than we've had today. And then we can keep going back. The material I'm presenting in this lecture uh, demonstrates the flows of cultural influence around the globe uh, from a very, really from the start, um, to the extent that uh, trade was happening across the Indian Ocean, about starting about 2000 years ago, the cultural exchange that went with that economic trade was, was, was huge. The influence on uh, societies, India was trading with China, China was trading with India, and all of those things were passing through the archipelago of Southeast Asia. So you see the global exchange uh, between China and India uh, coming together in the islands of Southeast Asia. And um, that was one of the earliest waves. Uh, then came Islam in the 13th century, transforming those societies. Then came, Euro came European colonization. Uh, and you can follow it right up to the present. But the layerings of cultural influence are still embedded in the fabric of the city. And it's not just a passive uh, operation. It is an active strategic decision that people who manage the form of cities make choices and they deploy architecture and urban form as a strategy for having certain outcomes. So this is, uh, you recognize right in the beginning, right in the first paragraph of the reading um, that I wrote, uh, not surprisingly, right away in that first paragraph, we encounter uh, the key question that's been at the core of this entire course. 
Uh, in part, this is um, a reaction against the way the history of architecture has been taught uh, historically in the past several decades. Um, the art historical approach to the history of architecture would have us believe that architecture, and this has been a big push in architectural history, that architecture isn't just an aesthetic thing that people are produced. It is also the, the big revolutionary push, the so-called revolutionary push, is to help us understand uh, economic forces, political forces, social forces, and building the, the story, the narrative of the history of architecture, that architecture and urban form are the manifestations of political, social, economic forces. So first come the social, political, economic forces, then comes the architecture. Uh, the architecture comes out of these larger forces that are acting on society. That was the big revolutionary push in the last few decades. I take it further, and this is a working hypothesis uh, that is the basis of this course, that architecture and urban form are not just a passive manifestation of larger forces. Those larger forces know what they're doing. They hire architects, they hire us for a reason. This has been true throughout history. It is certainly true now when uh, powerful and wealthy uh, actors in our society today during your careers, when they hire an architect, they are doing so because architects have the power to operationalize the built environment to achieve certain outcomes. And we looked right in the first lecture, we looked at Dubai, we looked at the Burj Khalifa, we looked at financialization forces. The reason those buildings, the reason the city of Dubai exists is that financial capital needs a place to park its money in real estate. That is the reason Dubai is there. That is the reason one Dalton place is there, uh, the new tower on the skyline of Boston. These forces are real. They are operating in your careers and the time frame of your careers. Uh, when I say, if you are the president of a country and you need to establish the image of the, of the new nation state after colonization, I say, who are you gonna call? You guys say, the architects. Um, the reason the presidents call the architects is they need something from architecture. They need architecture, in this case, to establish a symbolic uh, armature that can be layered with all of the meanings and messages of the nation state so that they can establish a powerful image of what it means to be Malaysian, of what it means to be uh, a citizen of Myanmar, of North Korea. These new capitals that are designed by architects are instruments of power. And so we are looking at um, we are are looking at things uh, from this perspective throughout this course that we are um, testing this hypothesis, looking at the historical record, and looking back in time to see whether or not uh, the degree to which this. Uh, remains true no matter how far back we go. And so that's, that's the thing to look for. That's the key question uh, of this lecture, of the course, and to a certain extent I, I am presenting to you. It's the question of your career. What does architecture do and how does architecture do what it does? And that's been the question guiding uh, the design of this course from the beginning, uh, which is to say, from the future of your uh, careers, the target, the test case for this course is uh, the decades of uh, 2050s uh, or so, when you will be at the peak of your career, you will be in control of the architectural practices that you are in you will be uh, called um, by mayors, governors, presidents uh, to 
to weigh in on the big issues of the day. Um, you will be sitting on planning commissions. You will be directing the work of your office. You will be meeting with clients. And uh, that is the moment of truth when you will either wield the very powerful instruments of architectural understanding and construction um, in, in, as a force for good and progress or not so much. So based on that, we look back in time. Uh, we look, we're going back to the first cities um, where we started. Remember on the first day of class, I said, let's, let's test out what happens to you, what happens to your brain and your body when I start talking about Jatal Oyuk. I hope I said that right, Asya. Jatal Oyuk is that first city. Yes, correct. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, and um, when we encountered this, these same slides in the first class, uh, what was the basis for understanding? We were starting from zero. Um, but now there is a bridge between this material and the present. Uh, you are the world's foremost experts on your own life experience. No one knows your life experience better than you. That expertise is something that you need to bring every day to your education and to your careers and to your practice. So um, that's why, uh, given the working hypothesis of the course, we were compelled to uh, flip the chronology of the course on its head and do it in reverse chronological order. So hopefully, when we now when we revisit this material, uh, you have a basis for connecting it somehow with your own life experience and with your own career trajectories. Um, so we may be going way back in time, back to the Big Bang, uh, and then moving forward in this lecture, but hopefully you now are equipped with the context by which this material might have some place in your, arm your, your armory, your, your weapons for going out and doing battle in the real world as you launch your careers. So here we go. Um, you remember the Big Bang 4.5 billion years ago? Uh, it wasn't until relatively recently that humans appeared on the scene 200,000 years ago. So if you take the existence of the planet and of the universe since the Big Bang as a 24-hour clock, humans don't show up until the last few seconds before midnight, uh, if midnight is the present moment. So humans uh, show up very, very late, and uh, that 200,000 years ago, and we know almost nothing about anything until uh, humans start leaving the fragments uh, of their exchange, fragments of their tool making in caves in Africa, uh, starting about 100,000 years ago in the caves of Blombos in, in the tip of South Africa. And so, uh, it takes a while for things to get going, but humans um, are looking for resources. Humans are expanding. Humans are looking for uh, landscapes that can supply their needs. And so we spread out. We spread out because of the need for resource extraction to support life. And this is the pattern of that spreading of resource extraction. And um, you'll notice that Africa is the birthplace, the Great Rift Valley is the birthplace of, of humans. Uh, and they spread over uh, the course of several tens of thousands of years across the planet. And the most recent expansions are here in orange uh, across the islands of, of the Pacific. And um, every, few months, there's new information that comes out. As recently as 10 years ago, we were saying that North America and South America, the Americas uh, were uh, the populations that uh, 
came across the Bering Strait to the Americas came only 6,000 years ago. Then we had to adjust it to 10,000 years ago. And just uh, a few years ago, the new information came in that no, it was really two waves of, of human movement, the earliest of which was uh, as long as 20,000 years ago. And throughout this whole thing, as uh, human societies uh, grow in size, they look for answers to questions that, that would otherwise be total mysteries. So the, 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 the striving, the aspiration to understand the world around us gave rise to explanations um, that were based on observation. Uh, really, um, it's not so much as a conflict between re religion and science. It's really a matter of uh, the same questions. How did this happen? How did we get here? Why do these events occur in our life of experience? How do we explain it? There must be, there are clearly large forces at work. How do we account for those large forces? And so to the degree we can observe natural phenomena in the world and explain them some way in what we would call now scientific explanations, that's great when you can get it, but we haven't always had ready access to these explanations, uh, scientific explanations. And so we look for other forces and they're really uh, best understood as thought experiments in terms of what can have explanatory power that can help us make sense of the world. And it's very similar to what we've been doing uh, every week in this course, when we take some evidence, some visual evidence, and we analyze it using the tools of architecture, we are doing the same thing. We're trying to make sense out of a world that doesn't necessarily make sense. And if you have questions along the way or comments, um, I have my chat open. You can raise your hand. Um, please feel free to interject. Um, and so um, we're reminded of um, things like volcanoes um, every day. Today, for example, uh, there's a new volcanic eruption that we'll uh, take a look at um, later in the slide lecture. But volcanoes, we, as we learned in the first reading, the, the Jatal Oyok reading uh, by Mark Yarzenbeck, that um, the source of these, that city of Jatal Oyuk was ultimately, it was a volcanic eruption that results in the production of obsidian glass that is useful uh, for tool making and thus has extreme value for uh, agricultural societies uh, and hunting societies where they can actually um, produce food and thrive based on the access to that material. And so you get um, the, the flourishing of societies to the extent where populations uh, can be supported. The productivity of uh, things like hunting, uh, um, I'm not gonna use hunting gathering, it was more as a proto agricultural where certain uh, conditions were nurtured uh, not quite formal agriculture at that point, but there were certain things that, uh, certain resources that could be augmented and um, fostered uh, and cultivated to create greater uh, surplus production uh, and population centers that then became uh, the basis of exchange. And so you see the sources of obsidian in the context in the Fertile Crescent, um, where exchange became a very powerful um, element involved in the formation of settlements that grew in size, grew in specialization, uh, and led to the first, um, the first cities. Uh, if, if you put the word cities in, in quotes and are loose about what the definition of a city is, which is what I like to do. I'm, I'm not 
Um, I'm not really obsessed with defining the boundaries of what is and is not a city. These gatherings of humans uh, have a lot of the same attributes um, that uh, we, we recognize in our, our experience of large settlements, although also known as cities. Now, one of the most interesting things about Jatal Uyuk is um, how it defies our assumptions about urban formation. Instead of having streets, um, we look at a drawing like this and we say, oh yeah, this is a reverse figure ground. Uh, the black is obviously uh, the open space of the streets. Um, that's how we would interpret this. But it turns out not to be true. This is a figure ground, uh, a positive figure ground where the white is the open space of the interiors of the homes. The black are not streets. The black are the thick walls. So each home would be built uh, with its own wall. And so they're double walls, basically. It's not, it's somewhat, I, I guess it is, uh, satisfies the definition of a party wall. But there's no circulation space between these houses. They are all uh, contained within each other. On the other side of every person's wall is someone else's wall or uh, the ground outside. Um, and so we got this far and then we saw this video. Remember that video? We're not going to look at it again. Um, but the interesting thing about Chatel New York is that it does the opposite of what we expect it to do. Um, it, it is an early example of, um, of a very unfamiliar urban formation. And artists have worked to uh, visualize what life might have been like. Um, Yarzenbeck says there was no public space, um, putting the word public in quotes. But I would say uh, the public space was on the rooftops. Uh, and public private, uh, as you've encountered in your studio work, uh, is kind of a, a very limited uh, vocabulary. It's really more useful to think about shared spaces and different degrees of sharing, different smaller and larger communities of sharing is a much more useful uh, way of understanding the way space works in most human uh, settlements and in most architecture. And so there was a lot of sharing going on at, as uh, would be familiar to us uh, as the public realm on the rooftops and um, people would enter the homes through the rooftops coming down ladders. Uh, it, one of the really striking things about uh, Chata Al Hoyuk is that they drew plans of their town in an architectural manner. Uh, this is an, uh, some of the remains of a mural of wall art uh, that I'm, if you can see my cursor, uh, and then this is uh, an artist's reproduction of that, enhancing. So this plan is actually in, shown in the walls. They, they were making architectural style plans uh, of their town. Um, figure ground drawings of the town exist in the time. Um, we often talk about uh, the, the religious uh, inspired artwork that um, is part of this, and the specialization. One of the most interesting things about Jat al Hoyuk is that for the longest time, archaeologists speculated that the only building type in the entire town was the home. Um, and that does, there is evidence to support that. But more recently, um, some of the homes have been, with further study, more digging, literally. They've found that there are too many burials in some homes to be accounted for as uh, domestic, you know, people who lived in that home. And so we now speculate that some of these homes uh, had greater meaning and took on the attributes of a sacred communal uh, shared structure um, through the burials, through the study of the burials. And so uh, some of these homes were 
may have specialized uh, to the point of constituting uh, a sacred realm, a temple of sorts. Um, and so this is one of the really interesting aspects when we think about why cities, why do we have cities? Why can't we just live in a suburban situation or a rural situation where we live off the landscape, we produce the things we need, and we consume what we produce? Well, um, as uh, production becomes more and more efficient, a single person can produce more than they need, and then you get specialization. One of the strategies for producing more than you need is to specialize, and then uh, becomes the need for exchange. And with that rise in specialization, you get uh, some urban specializations that are not involved with production. You actually get uh, a, a priest caste, you get rulers, you get uh, leaders. And so um, the, the forces that operate to drive the formation of cities, uh, one really important one is specialization in exchange situations. So uh, another word for that is economics. So if you want to understand cities, uh, it brings us back to the need to understand forces that lie beyond the realm of architecture itself. We need to understand economics as a force that is capable of driving the formation of cities. And with uh, economic understandings, uh, specifically uh, the, the dynamics of specialization. And um, one of the key specializations that at the core of managing these urban societies uh, for the last 10,000 years uh, are the specializations of religious belief systems. And now in the United States, the dominant culture, we take for granted that political leadership is separate from religious, um, religious leadership. And that is a very recent innovation that throughout most of human history, uh, religious and, and political power were melded in one. Uh, and while we're at it, economic, all of these things that we have managed to separate or in the post-war period, we pretend that they're separated, but the this, this stark reality increasingly um, we're discovering that no matter how we separate these powerful entities from each other, uh, corruption tends to bring them back together. So um, that's one of the things that we will be dealing with in our careers, as in, in your careers uh, moving forward. Um, and so this concentration of power um, manifests in cities. And the form of the cities um, are manifesting specializations. Uh, in, and one of the major forces that uh, allows this specialization is written communication. The first written communication was accounting spreadsheets to keep track of um, uh, crop yields, animals, numbers of people. So basically, the spreadsheets were the first uh, form of, of written communication. And it allowed, um, it, it was one of the key technologies for supporting the organization of vast, complex uh, operations that were these early settlements. Uh, and increasingly, uh, we're, we're getting to familiar territory here where we see, uh, if I asked you, where are the homes, uh, you would be able to tell me. And you would even be able to identify uh, in part, um, you, with careful study, you could probably uh, make a, a reasonable estimate of the number of households in this uh, city state of Ur. Uh, because of the architectural form and the need for uh, the supply of light and air to uh, 
the units, um, which is not a new innovation in the building code. It has been there from the very beginning. Humans need access to light and air. There needs to be circulation uh, to and from every distinct home uh, in the city. And you could also speculate uh, uh, as to what these larger structures might be and what they might do. Um, just because of uh, your ability to analyze architectural form. And so um, the centralization of certain functions, uh, specifically religious and political power, uh, the need to defend your city from uh, others who are jealous uh, of your resources, uh, protect your wealth, and internally to manage populations such that uh, people don't um, steal and kill. Um, and so these requirements of organization are what produce the structures of cities. And when I say structures, I mean both uh, the physical structures and the, um, the social structures, the political structures, the legal structures, all of these things uh, are important aspects um, that are that are tied together. At this point in the course, uh, you are familiar with uh, the phrase uh, formal spatial institutional arrangements. Uh, we used to only, in my education, we used to only talk about formal spatial relation uh, arrangements, um, but that is an incomplete uh, analysis. There are connections between form, space, and institutions. And by institutions, uh, I could be talking about rules of law, um, economic uh, organizational arrangements. Um, and so the codes of Hammurabi uh, were the first legal codes that were written down um, as part of the challenge of managing large populations around a central set of behavioral norms and practices to manage uh, the, the, um, the peaceful and productive operation of these large entities that we call cities. Uh, religion and the built, the material cultures uh, out of the, that come out of these religions are at the core of these operational codes and of managing these large populations of people. So I'm not diving into details uh, because um, we don't have time, uh, but just uh, I'm, the central theme of this is that cities become necessary as the complexity of exchange relationships um, grow, as specialization uh, becomes a dominant factor of, uh, of human exchange uh, and, and the necessity of exchange for the sustenance of human life in large agglomerations. And the more we specialize and the, uh, the more productive, that's the more production that that specialization allows to occur, the more complex our urban formations and architectural manifestations become. Any questions about any of this? This is an interesting moment uh, where we see uh, the gates, the famous gates of Babylon. Blue has a special meaning in this society uh, because of um, it's a rare and difficult color to achieve because the material uh, that produces these blues is very rare and very valuable and very expensive. And so it's reserved for the most important architectural elements as the gate to this palace entry, uh, the religious temple core of Babylon, which uh, uh, as we looked later in history um, through colonial uh, power uh, distributions across the planet, ends up in a museum in Europe and remains a, a, a point of contention uh, between 
uh, nations today. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon. Many of these sites were carefully excavated and preserved. Um, and unfortunately, with um, the rise of ISIS, ISIL, uh, a lot of these um, a lot of these monuments have been destroyed since these photographs have been taken. So they are lost forever, except in photos and drawings. Um, rivers, uh, when, when we teach the early history of architecture, uh, it becomes very clear that a lot of the driving force of early architectural history are architectures and urban forms that grow up around river civilizations in China, uh, the Pearl River and the Yellow River, in here, the Indus uh, River Valley in um, the area between Pakistan and uh, uh, India, and uh, the Nile River certainly in Egypt, uh, but uh, and eventually in the Americas, the Mississippi River civilization. So this is just one of the um, clear examples of the importance of water in the formation of early cities. This is the city of Mohenjo Daro. As recently as 40 years ago, we really didn't know uh, much about Mohenjo Daro. Uh, it was not excavated, but now it, it's one of the clearest demonstrations of uh, one of these early cities. We see something very different from Jata Uyok. Uh, we see uh, distinct buildings and recognizable streets. And you see uh, something that you'd be forgiven from calling the Cardo Decumanus, the north, south, east, west, central axial street, uh, the importance of the central place, and then rising up above the residential quarters of the city, you see a holy temple district of power. And uh, one of the things that is most interesting about this excavation and this discovery is the importance of water. And so uh, the ability to bring water in, water was clearly a gift from the gods. Uh, and this is not unique to Mohenjo Daro and the Indus River civilizations. Um, it, water is clearly a gift from the gods. In your careers, um, water will become a strategic resource uh, more than uh, oil currently is. There will be wars fought uh, increasingly uh, not so much about oil and uh, petrochemical uh, resources. Water will become the source of uh, global warfare as that resource becomes more and more precious. And we see uh, that it was always so from the beginning of cities. Uh, and so we, we continue to speculate um, and produce artists renderings of what life might have been like in these early cities. Moving right along, um, we now get to uh, the great civilizations, um, so-called, I use the word um, carefully, um, of China and India. And, um, and I, I pose you this question, when is money about more than just money? Uh, one of the reasons I have to ask this question is because of the context of the course. We are in the United States, and everybody knows that in the United States, what matters is the, the, the three most important things in the United States are money, money, and money. And so we, when we look back from that context, uh, back in history, we tend to see what is familiar to us. And so we look for money, money, money. But uh, the actual evidence in history suggests that while money might be uh, clearly, by all appearances, the most important thing, wealth uh, extraction seems to drive everybody uh, from the, the beginning of human history. But um, we start to see evidence that perhaps money in and of itself 
is merely a stepping stone to what really matters, which is power. And so uh, that's one of the things that uh, informs this historical uh, lens uh, that I'm using now. That resource extraction, who doesn't love a good old resource extraction as a generator of wealth? But at a certain point, um, wealth is not the ultimate goal here. Wealth is a means to an end. What we're really after is power. And that becomes uh, crystal clear in this evidence going back in history. So the urban form of the Chinese um, as represented in the diagram on the left and manifest in the analysis uh, we see of the Forbidden City. Um, I don't remember who did this analysis. Oh, Axel Solberg did this analysis. Thank you, Axel. Sorry that the credit is not there. Um, but it's a diagram of power with the greatest power at the very sacred center that is, uh, has limited access uh, and we, um, and then power emulates out from that center and decreases uh, as we move further away. Power moves along the central axis, power and sacredness. Um, it's uh, somewhat um, analogous to uh, the degree of, uh, of sacredness, the importance of the Kaaba at the center of the Islamic world system, uh, which uh, every time we turn uh, and pray five times a day, we are facing that red cube at the center. So it's a global geometry of power uh, and sacredness that envelops the entire globe. And the importance of understanding the geometry of power led uh, Islam to be the uh, global superpower when it comes to geography and geometry and mathematical calculation of direction, distance, the size of the planet, and all so that we could know which way to face when we pray. And that same brilliant scientific uh, innovation was extended to the stars, uh, mapping of the skies um, very early on, long before the Europeans had the uh, telescopes that allowed them to surpass what the early astronomers of Islam were able to achieve. So it's a similar geometry, uh, geometric worldview, uh, the Chinese, Islam. We're going to go deep now into uh, Hindu uh, religious understandings of these geometries as a source of urban form. Uh, and so uh, the diagram, this is not a great diagram. Um, this is a richer diagram, is that the understanding from the Vedas, from the Vedic literature, which is some 6,000 years old. Um, this, this is the oldest uh, religious text, uh, body of religious texts that we have uh, in human history. And they've been passed along for thousands and thousands of years. They are the basis for, how, uh, as you would expect, of right living and um, how to, what's the proper way to organize human societies. And that is true both in terms of behaviors and hierarchies, but also, not surprisingly, because uh, we are who we are, it is the basis for the organization of architecture and urban form. And so these diagrams uh, of the Vedic uh, principles of the human body are projected onto urban form. And so just as we have chakras, uh, the sacred nodes of the human body, where the forces of, um, of human life uh, come uh, at these, these special places, the basis for acupuncture, acupressure, uh, 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 these, these chakras, uh, the basis of yoga uh, in the human body map very directly onto the urban form of cities. And so you have the mandala uh, city type. The mandala is a geometric pattern 
of biaxial symmetry. And it is a meditative practice to produce mandalas in sand or uh, something that is ephemeral. Uh, it's a meditative practice. You produce a mandala out of sand as a meditative practice. It might take you six hours to produce one, and then you sweep it away, uh, just in case we lose track of the fact that all is ephemeral. Uh, all human life, all human existence is ephemeral. We're here today, we're gone tomorrow. And so um, these practices of human behavior, of belief systems, uh, uh, cover everything from the scale of the human body up to the scale of the urban form of the temple complex at the center of the city of Madurai, in this case, and outward beyond that city center, just as we saw in the Roman operating system, the grid of the city it extends out from the city itself and across the landscape, and you can still see it in the roads and uh, agricultural parcels uh, of Italy and across Europe, you see the same thing in the United States. There's a simultaneity between the grid form uh, that was established in uh, Jefferson City, Missouri, and the grid that grows out across the landscape uh, across the Midwest of the United States uh, from these urban baseline uh, center points. And the same thing here. You see an ordering system that orders the human body, and it orders the temple complex, and it orders uh, the city itself, and across the landscape, uh, connecting each of the holy temple centers of India. Um, we see it again in uh, Tirumala, the central uh, temple complex, and then uh, the city beyond it. Um, I actually looked for this town that I had, hadn't really, I wasn't familiar with on Google Earth, and it appears to have been transformed in some touristic um, temple land. So I, I would not recommend using this for your analysis. But this is a very clear uh, implementation of a set of building codes uh, that determine the form of the Mandala Temple City. Um, rectangular form, surrounding walls of fortifications, uh, North, south, east, west, axial, uh, wider royal roads, uh, dividing the city into four quarters. Um, this extra one, which I found very interesting, um, the road on the inside of the surrounding wall as a defensive measure, so you can supply your troops defending the walls. Uh, and then segregated residential enclaves for distinct castes and professions. This brings us back to these ideas of segregated residential enclaves. It's a very interesting early precedent for segregation um, that has been at the focus of a lot of my research um, recently. Um, distinct locations in the central city, depending on the sacredness or prof profaneness of the location. So the market in one place that is auspicious and the prisons and probably the dump uh, at the opposite quarter, uh, corner because it's less sacred. The royal palace in the east where the sun rises uh, based on the principles of the Vedic Hindu traditions. And then the temple, of course, at the center. And so um, we look at, we looked very briefly at the Chinese uh, precedence in its pure form in China. Now we've looked at the, the, uh, the Hindu, the Vedic tradition in its pure form in India. And now we go to the part of the earth where um, they come together across the Indian Ocean. Oh, you can't see my fingers. Um, to come to the island of Java. And zooming into the city of Surakarta that we learned about in the reading. Um, and because you did this reading, I don't really need to go in depth. Uh, uh, I'm just quickly referring to um, 
the, the basic themes of the reading and illustrating how they manifest in architectural and urban form. Here we see the quintessential mandala temple complex of Borobudur, the largest Buddhist temple in the world. And it's not in the land of the Buddha. It's not in the land uh, where Buddhism took root most uh, profoundly of China, Korea, and um, Japan. It's in this other place on the island of Java where for a brief moment of uh, several centuries uh, peaking around the ninth century when this temple was built, Buddhism was the central religion of this extremely rich landscape. Uh, the reason the landscape is so rich is because uh, every, uh, every couple decades, um, and sometimes more often, um, volcanoes erupt. This is the ring of fire. Volcanoes erupt. They drop ash uh, all over the island. And uh, it just so happens that this video was taken a few hours ago because the volcano um, in the proximity of Borobudur and the palace city of Surakarta erupted this morning. I got um, a WhatsApp message when I woke up uh, from some of my friends uh, living there that ash was falling everywhere. Um, one of the big threats is that the ash falls so heavily that it actually uh, collapses buildings because it weighs so much. It's, the ash is so thick and so dense, um, it can collapse buildings. But it also enriches the landscape. There's um, the volcano over the left shoulder of this Buddha at the top of Borobudur. And part of this is, uh, here's a, a video that was produced by a friend of mine of the palace. Sepuluh tahun yang lalu, saya berkenalan dengan Sri Sunan Pakubono XII, seorang Raja Jawa dari dinasti Mataram yang bertahta di... So, um, it's just to make clear that um, even though the Vedic Hindu religion is something that is 6,000 years old, uh, and a lot has happened since then, sometimes these things don't get displaced. Uh, again, because we're in the United States, we bring our experiences, our lifetime of, of expertise and experience, uh, we tend to project them onto other societies. And since the experience in the United States is that when a new thing comes along, it displaces the old thing. Uh, after World War II, uh, the world became a new place in our study of architectural history, uh, what we learned is that with the rise of modernism, the world was transformed and everything that uh, existed prior to modernism was rejected, swept away and displaced and replaced with the modern world, dry, driven by capitalist expansion uh, in the nation state. And that is the evidence for that is very clear and it's certainly something that is happening but that's not the only thing that's happening and this evidence uh, of these cities um, you'll notice over here this uh, monument this it's like the washington monument at the center of washington dc you see axial boulevards in the house manian sense you see uh, towers of, of capitalism emerging, global capital is arising in the, the, this is the capital of Indonesia and Jakarta. But you also see the informal settlements uh, in Indonesia, they're called Kampung, uh, and you see the informal settlements slowly being uh, demolished and displaced by these new developments. Um, uh, but at the center of it all, this symbol of the nation state, uh, 
built in the, in the first years after independence from Dutch colonial rule uh, to establish itself as uh, a, a capital city of a major nation uh, in the world order. Indonesia is the fourth largest country in the world. The first president was a modernist architect. And he said, uh, I need to establish Indonesia as a modern nation state on the world stage. Who are you going to call? The architects. Uh, and in this case, he himself as an architect pushed uh, the, the official architect of this monument to, uh, to produce it this way. It was really a collaboration. And this is not just a replica of uh, the Washington Monument. It is also a symbol of the Hindu Vedic religion. It is the Linga and Yoni brought together. Uh, the, the Linga is the symbol in Hinduism of the male genitalia. The Yoni is the symbol of the female genitalia. And together, the Linga and Yoni are the source of all human existence. And so we celebrate it in Hinduism as the source of all creation. Uh, it's a holy, sacred thing. And so here you have um, this giant Linga and Yoni, to use polite terms, uh, right in the foreground of, at the time, the largest mosque in the world. Indonesia is the largest Muslim uh, country in the world. Uh, and so you see this juxtaposition of Hindu, Islam, and just out of the frame is the, uh, oh no, there it is, the, um, the Episcopal Church uh, representing three major distinct world religions um, in one view here. So quickly moving through the city of Surakarta, uh, my own story as uh, a young uh, architecture you graduate of Cooper Union uh, in the midst of an economic downturn, uh, not unlike the economic downturn uh, that we anticipate um, um, plaguing your early professional lives. I don't know if you've given some thought to uh, what is lies ahead for you graduating in the midst of a recession. Uh, perhaps really uh, impacting the course of your careers as it did for me. Uh, I was interning, I was doing my co-op, uh, I, I was interning at IM Pay Associates in New York um, when the recession hit the East Coast. I relocated to San Francisco and was able to practice there for three years before the recession really took deep root in San Francisco. And at that point, I accepted a three-month grant to do research on, uh, on Indonesia, uh, the architecture and urban form of culture and urban space in the city of Surakarta. And um, I was able to stretch my three-month grant. Life was so good and so inexpensive in Indonesia and in, on the island of Java in the city of Solo, uh, also known as Surakarta. Life was so good and so cheap, I was able to stretch my three-month grant to a year and a half. And by the time I got to a year and a half, I managed to become for all intents and purposes, the royal architect of the palace. And so as the royal architect of the palace of the king of Java, I had to understand these principles uh, of the palace itself was not that special. It doesn't look very palatial, a lot of rotting wood columns because the king didn't have much money. He, uh, all the properties of the kingdom had been um, expropriated by the, the colonial, the post-colonial government, and so they had to make do on a shoestring budget. And so the priority of the king and the royal family was to keep the ceremonies going, because the ceremonies are the key to maintaining the balance between heaven and earth. And so the structure of the reading 
was that there are three distinct readings of this urban form uh, and of this architecture. The first reading is that uh, is kind of the the uh, U.S. Uh, the American centric uh, reading of these old places um, that we project onto other places. That there used to be this palace, and uh, there used to be a king and a royal family, and it used to be important. But now, let's face it, we're in a modern world. It's not important anymore. It's dead. This is the empty shell, like Bordeaux Bordeaux. There's no more Buddhism. There's no Buddhist society. But there's this dead uh, temple of Bordeaux Bordeaux. This is the same thing. Um, and so that's interpretation number one. The second interpretation is, OK, sure, there's still a royal family and a king. But it means nothing at this point. It's just a family. They will be gone any day now. It's inevitable. The palace will become a theme park and uh, we'll move on into the modern world. Uh, and that um, I was, uh, when I was asking questions after I first arrived, those are, I got those two stories. Um, but it turns out there's a third story that outsiders have been showing up in Java for 2,000 years, and uh, the Javanese have strategies for adaptation. They have strategies of cultural construction, of cultural adaptation. And they hold on to the principles of the Vedic uh, Hindu system of architecture and urbanism and of religious practice and of uh, the, the cosmological ordering of the world, they hold on to those beliefs, those operations, those ceremonies, even in the midst of cell phones and the internet. And so uh, it was essential for me to understand how these cosmological ordering systems of the religion map onto the architecture and urban form of the palace. So here's my understanding, if this is the, the diagram uh, of the universe, it imprints on the actual physical reality of the palace something like this. And it's not an animation. Sorry about that. Someday I'll make this a proper animation. Um, but the physical form of the city is the architectural manifestation of the diagram of the ordering of the universe. Now back to the central hypothesis here. Is this a passive manifestation of the belief system? Or is it something else? And what it turns out, the evidence that is suggested, is they had to make the, the palace complex, they had to make the city in this shape in order for it to perform its sacred functions. It had to do this because it is an instrument. It is not a passive manifestation of these political, social, economic forces. It is an instrument of control. It is an instrument of uh, establishing and maintaining and renewing the balance between heaven and earth. Uh, and so this analysis um, done by Reed Tozier, one of the students of the course many years ago, uh, starts to build on top of that evidence. Um, I was able, with my meager three-month grant, I was able to hire a team of architecture students to, um, to document, measure every square meter of this palace um, of, in the four years I was there. Uh, and it was uh, taken on, that data was taken on um, to um, a artist to create an artist rendering of the palace complex with the same orientation. And here you see Mount Merapi, the one that erupted this morning um, in the distance. And so uh, the ceremonies of the palace that I wrote about in what you read are performed in order to maintain that balance between heaven and earth. Here are those white buffalo that. Um, trot around the palace. When they uh, relieve themselves on the streets, uh, the young men will, will scramble to try to grab 
all the piss and excrement they can to take it home with them uh, to bless their, their croplands and their homes. It's based on uh, the first wave of understandings of religion uh, is based on the queen of the South Seas who lives underwater and blesses the palace. Uh, and every year there's a ceremony at the, the South Seas. Offerings are offered to the queen of the South Seas to renew that supernatural connection between the people of Java and the supernatural forces. Uh, beyond that, there's also um, uh, Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, and all of those religions are layered one upon, up on top the other in, in a hybrid formation that is quintessentially Javanese and at the heart of the Javanese religion. The, um, the fire that uh, destroyed the, the heart of the palace in 1985 was seen as the, a sign that something, uh, the, the king had done something wrong. Uh, something was not right. And as punishment, you lose your house. And so uh, the palace burned to the ground, but the library of sacred texts was unscathed right there. There wasn't even smoke marks on the wall. Uh, people still talk about uh, how this was so clearly a divine uh, retribution that destroyed the king's realm without uh, harming in any, didn't even mar the wall of the sacred library or the sacred tower devoted to the queen of the South Seas. So in the reconstruction of the palace, all of the religious practices were observed. This is uh, Gusti Dipo Kusumo, the one I write about in the, in the writing. There's the king uh, driving a gold nail into the bottom of one of the four central columns of the reconstruction. There's Gusti Dipo Kusumo again in the background. Um, and uh, I write about the ritual renewals. Um, so the long story short, you got it in the reading. These practices are not dead. They're not even dying out. Uh, they are moving uh, with full uh, fervor into the present and the future. Uh, people will compete to get the water that is being washed off of this sacred building at the center of the palace. Uh, and these women are gathering it in water bottles in these plastic jugs, uh, even to the point where they're wringing out the rags and funneling the last drops of that water, that dirty water that came off of the cannon in the sacred building, uh, wringing it into the jugs. Um, the royal palace uh, has a, a, a carriage that was a gift from the Queen of the Netherlands. Down here, there's an offering. It's not just a Baroque carriage. It has become, over time, it has accrued sacred power and is now an important religious instrument uh, that itself is part of um, maintaining the balance between heaven and earth. The Baroque architecture of the Dutch the fez of the Ottomans, the brass band of the Dutch, the tailcoats uh, of the Dutch uh, tuxedo with the tails clipped off so the sword um, can be tucked into the back and the sarong skirt. It's a, it's a hybrid uh, cultural appropriation uh, deluxe. The uh, linga and yoni combined with symbols of the Indonesian nation state, the Samir around the neck of uh, the Abdidalam, uh, symbolizing to the Queen of the South Seas that they are friends of the royal family. And so all of these symbols are layered together, the animist Queen of the South Seas, the Hindu uh, linga yoni, the nation state of Indonesia, uh, Islam, this is uh, a ceremony um, that takes place uh, every year at the occasion of Grebeg Maulud. Um, I think that's when um, Muhammad, uh, correct me, help me out here. Turn on your microphone and correct me if you can. Grebeg Maulud is when uh, the Prophet Muhammad um, 
brought down the laws from Allah? Help me out, Mo. Bye. No, that's not. What is it? What was that? What is Quebec Maulud? It's uh, the birth of Muhammad? Yeah, it's the birth of uh, it's called uh, Maulud. Maulud. Okay, so it's the birth of Muhammad. Yep. Thank you very much. Friends, don't let friends get that wrong. Thank you. Uh, the Linganyoni, to commemorate the birth of the prophet Muhammad, the Lingan Yoni are paraded through the fairgrounds at the front of the palace and into the uh, Royal Mosque of Surakarta, this building there, uh, which uh, is an architectural form based on the Hindu Javanese forms of the most sacred Hindu temples that you still see in Bali. Um, the sacred Hindu temple architectural form was culturally appropriated from Hinduism and redeployed as the uh, quintessential Muslim mosque form, which went from Java to the entire area region of Southeast Asia, including Malaysia um, and throughout the, the Muslim Southeast Asia world. Um, and after being presented at the great mosque, uh, the young men again scrambled to rip this thing to shreds and get every last scrap of it because it still has a lot of importance um, to the people. It's also a socioeconomic structure, the classic architectural complex. Um, the noble's house is surrounded by an informal settlement of uh, servants and um, families that belong to this larger community around the prince's or the noble's house. And they, um, the, it's understood that the prince will uh, sponsor uh, an economic activity like the production of textiles, the processing, the production of uh, tempeh or tofu or some other food. So some, economic production uh, to make sure that uh, the community of households surrounding the, pal the this minor palace, it's more of a mansion than a palace, um, that the entire community has economic uh, activities to keep them going. And in times of trouble, they form an army, a militia, uh, to defend this household um, and this community. And each of these houses is a replica of the palace structure. And uh, this continues uh, down the hierarchy that you'll see in rural villages uh, deep into the farmland, um, hundreds of kilometers away from the palace, you will see the same architectural structure replicated in the homes of uh, the populations across the entire island. This is an interesting colonial era development where um, the rural uh, minor servants of the colonial government occupy the inner block uh, around a central open space and the Dutch colonial officers occupy the outer crust of this urban formation. Um, it's, it's an interesting hybridization of the earlier of this structure. Um, so the palace uh, in recent years during my time there, um, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture identified it as an important location uh, and they decided to hold uh, their, uh, every three years they give the Aga Khan Award for Architecture and they have a ceremony and they, uh, they choose a location somewhere in the Muslim world to hold that ceremony. In 1995, that ceremony was held in this palace and uh, we worked uh, to uh, restore the buildings. And in doing so, we followed all of the Javanese um, rules uh, of how to do it. 
Uh, pa Asmo was my teacher. He is uh, a priest and a, and a carpenter and an architect. He is the holy uh, carpenter. He's the, what do you call it? The master builder priest of the palace. And uh, we worked together um, for several years in the restoration of this palace. Um, and then the Aga Khan Award for Architecture was held. Here's the king, the minister of culture, and his highness, the Aga Khan. And there I am, the translator uh, in the background, um, so that the king and the Aga Khan could talk. Um, and I think that's, that's the, the, the end of the lecture. Um, so what do you guys make of this? Let's, um, let's take um, some moments to try to make sense of this. What's the takeaway? Uh, I guess it's like interesting to see that foundation that both not like base off of off of like that diagram you kind of showed of the universe with the structure of that. Then you like see that into the in the city. Yeah, that um, whole cities can be organized according to a religious diagram. What else? Uh, and also that the urban uh, city or the, or the urban farm is is basically uh, layers of many different cultures and and um, beliefs and um, each other or like not replacing each each one but uh, going on on top of it. Yes. What else? How about this question of uh, passive manifestation versus active instrument? Should I call on someone? Kai, wake up. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Kai, you look so peaceful. <laughs> so, so what about this question of passive, manifestation versus active instrument. What does architecture do? How does it do it? Is it a passive manifestation? No. Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, I feel like you can't just sit around and let architecture happen. Ah, I like that. Yeah, you need to make a decision to create architecture because there has to be intent behind everything that you do so you can't just go around like putting stuff down you have to put thought behind it except in comprehensive studio right it has to be a plan what about all these smaller houses that weren't really planned for they're kind of just made by the habitants that live there I wouldn't call that architecture. <clears throat> well, um, I've visited architecture. Though. Just simply because, like, um, 
like even though it's not the formal gestures of like the government um they still like probably abide by whatever <laughs> the society whole then like informs the way that they design their houses as well um for example like in the reading how it said the language it was all, all like relative towards like um the location of the king Doing that that would probably inform some of the ways that they go about arranging the spatial um components of like city what else uh, one thing that I kind of, uh, this, the, since they, they planned the city in this, uh, about this connection from heaven to earth, uh, and it, that was like the early idea of the city, no matter what global forces came in, they all seemed to just kind of coexist because the city was built to follow one structure and like it was hard system because it's literally the built form of the city. Yeah, well put. I kind of had something like what Connor said earlier about having to have a plan. Um, I said that actually like their susceptibility to like a changing plan made them stronger as a city instead of having like such rigid ground level like to be this size or since since they could bend and adapt to like these different religions that were coming it made them like more powerful as a settlement. Yeah, the thing like that, not having a plan made them more powerful. The thing that um, I had to adjust to and was so difficult for me as a researcher was um, every bit of architecture had multiple uh, explanations and those different stories were not mutually exclusive. I feel like Thing. Like, I feel like maybe actually the argument is that everything doesn't have to have such a strict meaning and cities don't have to be so strictly planned that they can just continue to grow and be added on to and it doesn't have to always follow the same rule. Or certainly not a single rule. I feel like it's almost like the city is built and then all like the other ideas or ideologies that kind of occupy it kind of just change themselves more so than the city changed it them. Okay. So if the city was an instrument for uh, in this example, if the city is an instrument for maintaining the balance of heaven and earth, what is the city for today? Maintaining the grounds of society. The economy. Should, the economy. How do we see that? the grounds of society, the economy. Control. Say that again, Kai. What was that, Kai? I guess it all kind of just goes back to control and cities to whoever controls the cities probably controls a good portion of like everything well certainly we saw that in the history of redlining that um, the city was an instrument of segregation and marginalization and ultimately um, the construction of wealth or the uh, the lack of construction of wealth um, in, as we see it today. Especially within politics as well. 
Right. Um, so I think the more complex answer to the question, passive or active, passive manifestation or active instrument, I think uh, there's evidence uh, for both of those uh, that sometimes people build things because uh, or they pull things out of a catalog because they can afford it and they put it here or there because um, there's some space there and it's handy and there's nothing else to it. So sometimes it's the direct outcome of certain forces, but other times it's very much an instrument, an active instrument for wealth production as in Dubai, uh, of uh, segregation as in uh, Jim Crow United States. Uh, it's an active instrument for producing specific outcomes and everything in between. So maybe it's useful to think of it as a spectrum from passive manifestation uh, all the way up to active instrument of power uh, and uh, any architectural manifestation any architectural act falls somewhere on that spectrum. Um, and so to a large extent, um, architects and clients have choices to make. Uh, we can, um, and the, 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 the professional preparation that this program and this course is designed to offer is when an opportunity for doing something, uh, using architecture and urban form as an instrument for social transformation. Uh, friends don't let friends miss opportunities to do good things. And so how do we train architects to see the world uh, in this way, identify opportunities for doing good things and knowing what to do when those opportunities present themselves? Does that make sense? So um, when our students arrive in the thesis program, they are challenged to do exactly that, that uh, we ask students in the thesis program to identify, to look at the world uh, and identify the moments of truth where things can happen, where architecture is capable of doing something that will make a difference. And so that is the, the big challenge in the thesis program. And uh, increasingly, it's the big challenge in the profession. That how do we identify in a site, in a, a history, historical context, uh, how do we identify the operation of forces that present to us the rare and precious opportunity to do something uh, that will help? Does that make sense? Uh -huh. Yes. So um, this brings us to the term project. So in the in the review of term project uh, topics uh, last Monday, we were seeing some, or last Wednesday we were seeing um, some examples that were just interesting examples. Um, here's a piece of city that actually uh, presents a very clear pattern. Here's a very interesting example. Wouldn't it be great to understand and explore this example? Um, but uh, that falls short of the mandate of the term project. Uh, increasingly, as we go through our Wednesday sessions, we've been moving from 
uh, passive analysis, of removing the tape from just understanding uh, the situation, and we've been moving uh, ever more aggressively towards um, how does the analysis of this evidence support the taking of steps in this world through architecture? And so we've been uh, shifting in favor of uh, using the tools of analysis as the basis for an architectural intervention of um, action, uh, proposing steps, uh, proposing actions that can be taken uh, in the immediate future. So um, this discussion hopefully helps clarify the purpose uh, of the term project and your mission in the execution of the term project. Your mission is to uh, uh, use the tools of architecture that we've been developing in this course and over the uh, four years of your education. Use those tools to identify evidence and develop the evidence in support of a targeted architectural intervention with uh, specific beneficial consequences. And in doing this, we really are uh, getting you ready for being effective um, leaders in the profession and successful uh, candidates in the thesis program, should you choose to go that route. But even for those of you who don't choose to go into the thesis program, uh, this is still uh, at the core of the ethical practice of architecture is the sensitivity to the larger historic social, political, economic forces operating through the built environment being able to see those forces operating through physical form is the first step to being effective uh, designers uh, and making a positive impact on the world. So any comments or questions on this? Can we read your comments? Um, um, our projects will you be available by like email uh just yes. like as we're picking our selections and so sketch writing so i'm not sure okay. who's internet um just to repeat um, when oh when uh when are when are uh when should we look at that uh, prezi to read our comments uh, I will be working on that this afternoon, and I hope to complete it by five. Okay. And then you can contact me by email, and um, I should be back up and running on Monday, be able to respond. Um, just to be clear, our schedule uh, moving forward, let's take a look at that. Are there any other questions uh, as I um, get this, get our schedule back on screen here? Questions? Let's take a look at what our schedule is moving forward. <clears throat> so everyone is clear that on Wednesday, we will be proceeding as always uh, to the Prezi, and as we did last week, we will be engaging on Zoom 
as a uh, as we uh, develop an action plan coming out of the analyses that emerge from this week's of analysis. And specifically, I think that um, uh, even though we were looking at historic examples uh, from Mesopotamia from uh, 6,000 years ago, or 7,000 years, or, or 9,000 years ago at the dawn of the agricultural revolution, um, the cosmological ordering systems that uh, are still imprinted on cities from history, but there are also contemporary examples. Um, it might be useful to look at capital cities because um, right up into the present and during your time of practice, architects will be designing capital cities for nation states that are produce um that produce uh, diagrammatic imprints on urban form uh, that have symbolic and uh, practical meaning and impact on the people occupying those places so uh, the body of evidence uh, that you tap into for the analysis on wednesday um, some of you might be interested in older historic uh, situations like the one I presented today in Surakarta and in Madurai, but uh, some of you might be more interested in looking at um, some of the capital cities that have been produced in the last few decades. Um, Putrajaya, Malaysia is an interesting one. Uh, Pyong, um, Pyongyang, North Korea is a fascinating example. Myanmar, um, Abuja, uh, Nigeria. Uh, the new cap, uh, there's, uh, I'm not sure if the new capital of Indonesia has been released yet, but that I suspect that will be, uh, the, some of the early renderings of that show a remarkably uh, diagrammatic, uh, symbolically driven capital proposal um, so those those are our possibilities that what we're looking for are symbolic diagrams like a mandal like them in the tradition of the mandala city uh, diagrams that are imprinted in urban forms and um, even though we're talking about plan views we really still hope to get that uh, overarching diagrammatic pattern to be in the background and an architectural scale human experience of activity in the foreground. We hope to still get that into those things. Questions about that? Um, and on Wednesday, uh, I will uh, give you a sense, a better sense of how we're going to fulfill the purpose uh, originally intended, if you see the syllabus here, for um, Friday, April 3rd, Wednesday, April 8th, and our final. Um, so next, next week, um, Friday, April 3rd, and Wednesday, April 8th, those class sessions were originally intended to be like a workshop session we might do that on Zoom in the uh, using the breakout rooms that worked so well for us uh, last Wednesday. And then the final class meeting Friday, April 10th, will be um, in the forum Prezi mode that has become familiar at this point. Any questions about anything? So anyone who wants to hang out after class, um, please do so, and um, I can answer any specific questions you might have about um, the project, um, the analysis for Wednesday or your term project. Thank you, everyone.